Let's begin lecture twenty. From today, we will look at, will study, PIC PIC microcontroller. Just a reminder that we have homework due is Thursday and exam two is on Friday. First, we want to give you an overview of microcontrollers. What is a microcontroller? Essentially, a microcontroller is a device which integrates a number of the components of a microprocessor system onto a single microchip. What we saw, well, what we learned uh, in the previous several weeks is the x86 Intel's microprocessor. And in order for the microprocessor to execute instructions to interact with peripheral uh, devices, it has to be connected to some memory components. We talk about uh, the input and output and memory and uh, microprocessor as an overall architecture. Um, the difference here, this microcontroller, is kind of a uh, all-in-one. So it has computational capability. It has ALUs, it has registers, it has computation. It also has memory units on chip. Uh, because it's on chip, you can imagine that there's limitation on the size of memory. So the memory units, even though it has some, but the capacity is small. And in this memory units, the on chip, the microcontroller will store instructions, that means the programs. Also, it will use memory units on the chip to store data. Besides these computational elements, CPU, uh, program memory, data memory, it also has a lot of things that's uh, useful in certain application domains. For example, uh, embedded control, sensing. If you look at the diagram on, on the right, this is a single chip microcontroller. In the center, we have the CPU. We have RAM, which stands for Random Access Memory. ROM, it stands for Read Only Memory. So these are the memory that are used for stored program and data. Besides those, we have timer. We have ADC, or analog digital converter. We have zero controller for zero communication. We have different ports. Those are not there in the general purpose microprocessor like Intel's Pentium or Xeon chip. These interesting elements, ADC, timer, zero controller, other peripherals, other ports, those are in fact very useful in certain application environment. For example, uh, take a remote controller as an example. You can have a remote control to control your TV, control your stereo player. Um, there is in fact a microcontroller in it. It will sense your button inputs. It will send out uh, IR signals to talk to the TV set. There will be some encoding because each TV is different. Uh, it may have a um, simple LCD display to show the battery or show the channel number. Um, so all these things requires, for example, to process signal that are either digital or analog. Um, and these tasks carried out by such microcontrollers are often simple, routine. It doesn't require very heavy computation. For example, you wouldn't expect your remote controller will do a 3D rendering uh, of a, a complex image because that's going to require a lot of computation power. But these kind of microcontrollers are very useful in these um, embedded computing environment. Mm -hmm. A typical microcontroller has processor. Uh, usually we refer processor here as the 
ALU or uh, data path or computational unit. But it can also have application specific units. For example, it may have a encryption unit to just handle the encryption decryption. A microcontroller also has on-chip memory. Often we have RAM or random access memory for data and flash memory for programs. It has integrated peripherals. Some common peripherals include parallel I.O. ports, for example the port A, B, C that we saw, clock generators, timers. It may also have special purpose devices such as analog to digital converter or ADC or mixed signal components or SPI or I2 or USB interfaces and you may support Ethernet uh, directly from the microcontroller. Benefits of having such microcontroller is that they uh, typically consume very low power, very small power, and they are very cheap. And they are targeted for embedded applications. To program these microcontrollers, we have uh, options using assembly language or even using high-level languages like C. Their instruction set are simple. Most of them are RISC processors or reduced instruction set uh, processors. And the development tools has very simple development process that is support. Limitations of these microcontrollers include small storage space because everything's on chip restricted instruction set or it may require to multiplex pins uh, we'll see in the PIC microcontroller exam as an example its microcontroller families often the time the pins of these microcontrollers are multiplexed so what's the meaning of multiplex multiplex or multiplexing means that for a single pin, we're talking about physical pin from the chip, you can have different functionalities. You can configure the pin to be analog pins or digital pins. It could be input, digital input or digital output. Or you can use a pin for analog to digital conversion. So it may have multiple functions and you choose the function by program the chip. Such microcontrollers are not typically used for high-performance computing, like the 3D rendering or um, high-intensive um, transcoding operations. In our class, we focus on PIC microcontroller. These microcontrollers are manufactured by microchip technology. Their performance is uh, decent for embedded applications, and they are very cheap, typically in the range of a few dollars or even tens of dollars for high-end ones. It works strictly with 8-bit data, although it has recently released many 16-bit uh, and 32-bit PIC microcontrollers. In our class, we focus on 8-bit microcontrollers. They vary in complexity and characterized by example, for different PIC microcontrollers, there may be a different number or different types of interfaces supported. SPI, uh, uh, I2C, those are serial communication protocols. Ethernet is networking. The number of instructions vary from 35 to 80, uh, depending on the actual PIC microcontroller you use. The amount of internal memory is different from processor to processor. Also, it has different uh, internal modules, for example, compare, timers, etc. Let's look at this PIC 16F1829. This is a mid-range PIC microcontroller. It has 49 different instructions. It supports interrupt. This interrupt concept is same as the interrupt we talked about for x86. 
basically referring to the capability that a processor can respond to external events. This microcontroller supports direct, indirect, and relative addressing mode. It consumes about 650 nanoampere at 32 kilohertz, and the operating frequency um, voltage is 1.8 volts. It has up to 17 I.O. pins with individual direction control. It has on-chip 10-bit A to D converter, and it has timers and counters. Other special features include internal and external oscillator, so you can operate the chip without providing an oscillator circuit uh, from outside. You can just power on the chip and it will operate. Because any processor, in order for the processor to do work, it has to have a clock. The clock signal can be coming from outside, or in our case here, the peak microcontroller has the clock generated from inside. You just supply the power. Uh, you can put this chip into different mode. For example, for saving power, you can put it into sleep mode. Uh, that's why your remote control can last for, say, a couple of months without the need to change a battery. Because when you, when you do not use it, it puts itself to sleep mode. Um, for program the chip, we put the code into flash memory. Flash memory is different from a regular uh, DRAM or SRAM in the sense that when you program this microcontroller chip, the PIC microcontroller, you program once and the code will stay there until the next time you program. Even when you power it off, your instructions are still there. This is another difference from the Intel x86 microprocessor because Intel microprocessor, their program, their instructions are not stored inside the chip. It's actually stored in the memory. When you power down the system, the content in the memory is lost. So your processor will not be able to do anything. Whereas for the PIC microcontroller, when you power it off, the program, the code, still resides inside the microcontroller. because of the flash memory. This is a block diagram shows you how we connect uh, this CPU to different boards and devices, peripherals, or units on the chip. For example, here we have um, clock units which will generate clock signals to drive the CPU. And we're going to see the internal architecture of the CPU in the next slide. This program flash memory, this is where the instructions are stored permanently. By loading the instructions into the CPU, these instructions can be executed and depending on the exact instruction, the CPU may access data that's stored in this, this RAM. Also, the instructions can allow the CPU to communicate with other um, external devices connected to port A, port B, or port C. These are the parallel uh, I.O. ports uh, that we can use to connect it to the things you want to control or the things you want to sense. For example, you can connect it to a sensor uh, and then get the input data um, to the CPU. There are uh, a bunch of other units, for example, ADC, uh, timers, etc. This is what's inside the CPU. Um, now, it's a busy diagram, so let's start from here. This part is the ALU. This is the arithmetic logic unit. That's the main computing unit. It has inputs. Okay. For example, if you do A plus B, your variable A should be here and B should be here, and this will do the addition and the result will come out. 
And this output can be put into a special register called a W, or the result can be sent it back to the RAM, which is where we store data. And the inputs from um, the MUX can be coming from, for example, instruction or from this RAM. Uh, I think the takeaway message from this diagram is that the computation is going to happen on two operands and the output uh, can possibly be put into the working register, this W, and the W is one of the inputs to the ALU. And this is important to know because we'll see in later slides, later classes, when we talk about instruction set of PIC, this working register, W, plays a very important role. This is the pinout of that chip. Uh, it has 20 pins, uh, VDD's power supply, VSS is the ground, and you can see many of these pins have multiple symbols signed. For example, this one is RA0 slash ICPDAT, uh, and for this one, this MCLR slash VPP slash RA3, those are examples of the, we call the multiplex the pins. Each one pin may have different functions. And most IO pins are for, you can access them by using port A, B, or C. As you can see it's here, RA5, that's bit number five in port A. This RC1, this is um, pin bit number one from port C. We will introduce the concept of Harvard and von Neumann. Let's start with this von Neumann architecture. This is described how the CPU is connected to memory. The Intel microprocessor follows this von Neumann architecture. So you can think about this is the Intel microprocessor, this is the memory where you have program, data, stack. So all the segments we're talking about are all here in this um, memory address space. In contrast, there's so-called Harvard architecture, where this is the CPU, and you can see we have separate program memory and data memory. This is what the PIC PIC microcontroller uses. In PIC architecture, this is the CPU. It will load the instructions from program memory and it will access data that's stored in data memory. Program memory space. We know that PIC uses Harvard architecture, it has a separate program memory space from data memory space, and this is the program memory space. It's essentially a memory that has addresses, and starting from address zero all the way up to a number. In our case, we use one FF F as a number to show that we have um, 8K locations. And each slot here is an instruction, and that in each instruction is a 16, uh, sorry, 14 bit wide instruction. There are two special locations in this memory space. One is called reset vector, the other one is called interrupt vector. Just remember these numbers, zero and four. These are the addresses, okay? With this address, we can find an instruction that's stored in the program memory. So at this special address zero, that instruction is called reset vector. And at this address 4, that's where we have the interrupt vector. Reset vector is 0. When the CPU is reset, its PC is automatically cleared to 0. So when you first time power on the PIC microcontroller, it will load whatever instruction you put here. Okay? Because the, um, its PC, the program counter, is cleared to 0. If there's interrupt happens, whatever instruction you put it here, that instruction will be executed. That's the meaning of the interrupt vector.
data memory, we have four registers. Well, on the right, this is the data memory region. Again, we have these addresses. We start from 0 and all the way up to 7F. This is, in fact, only a bank of the memory. This bank has 128 bytes. Okay, each um, minimal addressable unit here is a byte. So we have 128 bytes in a bank, and we may have multiple banks. So, so that's another uh, difference between the data memory here in the PIC from the data memory uh, in x86. So in PIC architecture, in PIC microcontroller, we have these memory banks. Each has 128 bytes. Within a bank, we have here core registers. Those are not affected by the operation of a device shared by all, across all the banks. We have special function registers. We have general purpose registers. And then we have common RAM that you can use. I think you might be a little bit uh, overwhelmed by these new terms, new concepts. We talk about so many new things here in the last couple of minutes. Program memory, data memory, banks, reset vector, um, uh, interrupt vector. We'll go over these concepts again and again when we talk about the instructions. So don't worry too much about that. I just want to mention a few core registers here. Those are the registers we will uh, rely on for certain instructions. W register, or the working register, is the one we mentioned when we talk about the internal architecture of the CPU. This working register is to move values from one register to another. And the value uh, for this movement must pass through the working register. Simply because when we do the copy, the, ha the operation has to be done by ALU, and the output of the ALU is going to the working register, which is, again, one of the inputs to the ALU. And we have file select register, FR0, FSR1, and we have indirect access uh, registers, INDF, 0 and 1. And we have PC, the program counter, uh, which consists of two parts. Uh, the lower part and the higher part, PCL and PCLLATH. And we have BSR, Bank Selection Register. Okay, I'm going to use this slide as the last one for today's lecture. PCL and PCLATH. Those are the two parts from the program counter. Program counter we have uh, for the particular PIC, what, PIC micro 16F, uh, chip we are talking about, it has 15 bits. So with 15 bits, you can access up to 32K locations. So that is to say, in this particular memory, in this particular PIC microcontroller, we can store up to 32K instructions. So this is the whole thing. So from bit 0 to bit 14, so we have total 15 bits for the whole program counter. The way we store the whole thing is by using two registers, PCL and PCLATH, or PCH. The lower 8 bits of PC is stored at PCL. Okay, so this is the PCL. And the rest of the bits will be stored at PCLATH. And in our case, total, because we have 15 bits, so 15 minus 8, so the upper 7 bits will be stored in this PCL ATH register. So if we want to change the program counter, like we do a jump or call instruction, that's where we change the um, address of the next instruction. The way we can do it is we can write to the PCL directly. That is to change this program counter directly. If this changes, then the microprocessor will use the new value to fetch the next instruction and then continue from there. So that's how uh, one way to uh, do the jump. There is a jump instruction, or go-to instruction, in fact, in the PIC microcontroller. You can also do call or call W 
uh, or doing relative branches. So there are ways to change the PC. You can write the PC out directly, or you can do a go, go to instruction, or you can use call or other instructions. Yes, so for the PIC microcontroller, you do need to uh, think about how you program your application so that it won't, it still can be fit into the chip. Uh, it's the program size compared to Intel processors, the program size of PIC microcontrollers are very small. Um, but depends on the actual application. If it is, for example, a remote control, the function you expect from the remote control is also very simple. Um, so the with 16K or 32K or even 8K instructions, you will be able to accomplish the task. But when you design the actual program, you need to consider how you can reduce the size of the program. So let's stop it here and we'll resume next week. In the next uh, couple of slides, starting from this one, we'll look at some of the core registers. Status. Status is similar to the flex register in x86. This register is used to store the computation result. Specifically, um, the bits in this register will say whether uh, there's a zero generated from the last operation or if there's a carry bit generated in the last operation. And not only these zero and digital carry and the carry bits, uh, it has also so-called the timeout bit and power down bit to indicate the overall operation status of the PIC microcontroller. Stack in PIC is a 16 level deep, 15 bit wide hardware stack. In x86, we have a whole stack segment which has 64K bytes in it. In PIC microcontroller, this stack is very, very small. And it has only 16 levels. That means it only has 16 entries in this stack. The operation of the stack is, again, first in, last out. So the first thing, first thing you put in it will be the last one coming out. The main purpose of this stack in PIC is for the subroutine instructions. When you make a call, when you go to a subroutine, the PIC microcontroller will store the address of the next instruction onto this stack so that when the subroutine is completed, the microcontroller can come back to the caller program, to the appropriate location. So essentially, the program counter is pushed onto the stack when a call instruction is executed or an interrupt caused a branch. And then, correspondingly, the stack is popped in the event of a return, return LW, or a return FIE instruction is executed. However, there are no explicit push or pop instructions. So it's different from x86. In x86, you do push EBX or push AX, and then you do pop EBX or pop AX. So you do use push and pop instructions in your program. But in the PIC microcontroller, there's no push and pop instructions because it's automatically done by the microcontroller when you execute call uh, instructions like that. The stack operates as a circular buffer. All the stack has been pushed 16 times. After that, then the 17th push overrides the value that was stored from the first push. We can track the stack overflow and inner flow um, in to handle such conditions. Okay, banking. We showed you earlier in the slide that for a memory bank in a PIC microcontroller, 
it has 128 bytes. And for a PIC microcontroller, it may have two or four, even eight banks. That is to say, data memory is partitioned into banks. In the PIC family, each bank holds 128 bytes. So the maximum offset for accessing data in a bank is 7F. That gives you 7 bits. And this 16F1829 has 32 banks. So you can number them bank 0 all the way through bank 31. Then we can calculate the total data memory. That is to 32 multiplied by 128. So you got 4K bytes of data memory. So for accessing these 4K bytes, we are talking about um, 4K locations, and we'll need 12 bits to access this 4K locations. You can do the math. 2 to the power of 12, that's 4K, well, 4,096. So that is to say we will need such a 12-bit address to find out any of these data or any bytes in this uh, 32 banks. Out of these 12 bits, the lower 7 bits, the lower 7 bits are used to access the content within a bank. Why 7 bits? Remember the 128 bytes per bank? 7 bits will give you uh, the location of any one of these bytes in the bank. Then the upper 5 bits, all of the overall 20 bits, I'm sorry, all of the overall 12 bits will come from uh, the BSR, the Bank Select Register. We'll see more examples. But keep in mind here is the upper 5 bits will tell you which one of these 32 banks you are going to access. So essentially, the way the microcontroller finds the data is first decide which bank to access by using the five upper bits. After that, it will use the lower seven bits to find out which byte in that particular bank. Now let's talk about addressing mode. And we're going to explain what is the direct addressing and indirect addressing in PIC microcontroller. Let's start from this diagram by looking at the bottom part. This is the 32 banks of memory that this PIC microcontroller has. You can see we have bank 0, bank 1, bank 2, and through bank 31. So total we have 32 banks. Each bank has the same size, which is 128 bytes. And the starting address of the byte within the bank is 0, and the maximum offset for a byte in a bank is 7F. So using this 7 bits, you can essentially find out any one of these bytes in a bank. So we mentioned earlier that to find operand, or to find any byte out of these 32 banks, you need to partition the 12 bits into 5 and 7. Okay? 5 bits will tell you which bank, and the lower 7 bits will tell you which byte in the bank. And then let's start with this direct addressing. You see here we have 5 bits, and then this is 7 bits. Overall, we have 12 bits. These 5 bits are used to select the bank. We call them bank select. And the lower 7 bits are used to select a location on the bank, so we call them location select. 
BSR is the bank selecting register. This is a special purpose register, and we'll um, see more examples about this register. But what we want to show you here in this diagram is that this BSR register will give you those five bits. BSR is a byte-wide register. We only need five bits from it. These five bits will tell you, hey, out of these 32 banks, which one? Okay. Five bits, if you do math, two to the power of five, that's exactly 32. So once we get these five bits, we know exactly which bank we're going to access. So we're going to stick to that bank. Let's say, for example, if I have 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. That is to say the bank select is 1. So we're going to access this bank 1. Then we're going to look at these lower 7 bits. These lower 7 bits are from upper code or from the instruction. So when you have an assembly language instruction for the pick, many of the instructions will take one operand, that is the name of the register or the location of the register, and that's where you get these seven bits. We'll see examples of these such instructions in lecture 21. But given these seven bits, you can use them to find within this bank one, where is my operand? If I have, for example, zero, 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 one, one. Well, that's three. So th that is to say, I'm going to find the operand, which is in bank one, and its offset is three. So somewhere here. And then I'm done, because that's essentially what the addressing mode will do. It'll help the microcontroller to find that operand, that data. Okay? Okay, now we're going to move on to a different addressing mode, which is called indirect addressing mode. The one we just explained, that is called direct addressing mode. The indirect addressing mode has the same purpose as the direct addressing mode, which is to find that byte, find that operand. So again, we'll need those 12 bits, upper 5 and lower 7. Well, for indirect addressing mode, the source of these 12 bits are different from the direct addressing mode. In direct addressing mode, the lower 7 bits are from the upper code, and the upper 5 bits are from the BSR. In direct addressing mode, we'll use this FSR register um, to find the, this information. So we're going to use FSR low and high. And the lower seven bits of FSR low will tell you the location, and most significant bit of FSR low with the least significant four bits of FSR high together. These are the five bits, and these five bits will tell you which bank. So the message here is both direct addressing mode and indirect addressing mode will help the microprocessor, microcontroller find the operand. Both of them will need to provide the 5-bit bank select information and then 7-bit location select information. Well, the difference between these two is the source of these bits.